Hello everyone, Loremaster Sotek here, and it's time for our third prediction in the next year of Total War type stuff as we work our way through the kind of quartet, or what I believe to be a quartet of DLCs, which each feature a Chaos God versus two other races in some kind of three-way battle of awesomeness. So yesterday we talked about the Thrones of Decay. The day before that we talked about Shadows of Change. So today we're going to be talking about the first mystery DLC. However, it's not a full mystery as the artwork does reveal that it is the Slanesh DLC. So the Dark Prince will be the kind of feature villain, I guess you could say, or um, I, don't, I don't know if it's going to be the protagonist or the antagonist or how that's going to work with a three-way battle, but whatever. Slanesh in three ways is a, is a tale as old as time. But <laughs> moving on from that, let's talk about what I think is going to be appearing in this DLC. So the first things first is that we do not know who the other two races are that will be participating in the fight with Slanesh. Now, based on the other two that came before, uh, Shadows of Change and Thrones of Decay, it seems to me that the other races are themed. So, like, with Zinj, Zinj going up against Kislev and Grand Cathay, there's kind of a theme there, right? It's these northern border nations. It's these two realms who are who have a lot in common. Uh, Grand Cathay and Kislev are very, very closely related when it comes to theming, as far as they both have to directly face off against the forces of chaos, and they are kind of the border guards. They are the ones who have to hold out when no one else can against the forces of chaos and try and prevent these legions from making their way um, down. So there is kind of a lot of interweaving plays there. They both kind of have these shadowy secret police type forces with, you know, the moon empress and her um, various followers, especially the Onyx Crowman. And then of course uh, the Kislevites with like the Akshina and also a lot of the more shadowy elements of like the hags and Ungol culture. So there, there are a lot of really close ties there. Then when we look at Nurgle versus the empire and dwarfs, um, those are very, very classic matchups. Um, Nurgle is kind of the primary antagonist in a lot of ways when, when you're dealing with like full armies, right? So not from a role play perspective, because in the role play, traditionally Zinch is the main baddie a lot of the time for the empire. But when you're looking at like big armies and stuff like that, I would actually say Nurgle tends to be the main antagonist for the empire when they're not dealing with like full on ever chosens. Uh, Nurgle tended to get, uh, Nurgle got a lot of attention, especially towards the end of fantasy with the major invasion of the empire being led by the Glotkin during the end times. And Nurgle had an entire part dedicated to him just versus the empire. And then of course, Tarmacon being the only of the dark gods that got a major invasion from, uh, the East being Nurgle. So it makes a lot of sense for Nurgle to be going up against this Grand Empire. And of course, the dwarfs have uh, arguably the longest relationship as uh, an enemy of Nurgle, uh, where they have been facing off against him since the very beginning. Because during the, the War of the Great Cataclysm, when Chaos first came into the world, each of the Dark Gods kind of took on a different main opponent, where you had Slash facing off against the Elves, Zinch was uh, dealing with the Lizardmen and Lustria, uh, Nurgle fought the dwarves and then Korn was off doing other things. But, um, so having the dwarves in the empire who once again are very closely related, they're extremely closely related. You know, they're ancient allies. The dwarves in many ways are the kind of the precursor to the empire. And they helped, uh, give a lot of knowledge and information to the empire that led to them becoming what they are today. And the two of them bear a lot of similarities, uh, in, that they're kind of they tend to be a little bit more conservative leaning uh, empires that are more about defending what they already have and trying to maintain a desperate grasp onto um, the lands and empires they've built. So it makes a lot of sense there. So with Slanesh, uh, frankly, I feel pretty confident that it's going to be elves. Um, now, which elves will it be is a much more interesting and difficult to answer question. I will say that my, I, I feel very, very sure that high elves are probably going to be the second race. 
Uh, the Hiles have a ton of things that can still be done with them. Uh, as far as DLCs go, they're still missing, like just thinking about um, like kind of theming, uh, they're still kind of missing some of the more... Um, they're missing a couple of like, uh, they're missing an ocean themed DLC in a lot of ways, uh, which we'll get into the specifics later. They're also missing a couple of characters. Uh, there's, there's monsters they're missing. There's units there's missing. Uh, so there's plenty of stuff to do with the high elves. Um, and I think they will very, very easily slot into that position. And frankly, there is no other race that has as much of an antagonistic relationship with Slanesh as the high elves. You know, the high elves have remained the closest to the original elves. Um, although they, there are some notable differences between them and the original elves. Uh, the high elves have maintained a lot of that culture and are really kind of the big bad when it comes to dealing with Slanesh. As far as who the third group will be, I do think it will be another elf race. But the question is, will it be wood elves or dark elves? Uh, I think when if you're trying to deal with two elven races facing off against Slanesh that have parallels in their, their relationship with Slanesh, I honestly think the dark elves fit a little better. Um, I think the dark elves do have a lot of really fascinating... Uh, ways that you can kind of apply that uh, that antagonistic relationship they have with Slanesh, where Slanesh is kind of in the undercurrent of their culture, especially through Marathi. Uh, but a lot of the regular Dark Elves outside of Marathi really don't like Slanesh, um, especially the Canites. The Canites despise Slanesh. And there's also a lot to be said for the Pleasure Guardus, um uh, authority also does not care for Slanesh very much because they take up very similar, um, they take up very similar, uh, environs, um, from a like religious standpoint or in the God sphere. So there's like a notable rivalry there. Um, the dark elves though, and the wood elves do not have as much of an easy expansion. I will say, uh, it is more difficult to explore what is left to do with the dark elves and the wood elves. Uh, they do not have any super obvious things missing and there's no guarantee that it's two elven races, but I feel like that would make the most sense. Uh, as far as which of them I would predict personally, I think it's going to be Slanesh, high elves and dark elves. Uh, I do think that would make for a pretty, uh, pretty fascinating, uh, storyline and you could have a lot of really interesting, uh, explorations of the only evil that is possible uh, to fight against that would actually cause the dark elves and the high elves to kind of almost have a sympathetic storyline as far as, uh, you know, most of the time there is nothing the high elves and the dark elves hate more than one another, but Slanesh is kind of a more existential threat. Slanesh is like, uh, you know, whenever a, an elf dies, if they do not have some kind of security in place, then Slanesh will feast on their soul for eternity, or at least until Age of Sigmar. So, you know, there is there is a profound fear in the deep baseline of both cultures of Slanesh. And, so, you know, that could be said for the Wood Elves as well, but the Wood Elves do not have as much of an intense relationship with Slanesh as the other two do. So, um, for the sake of this video, I am going to talk a bit about what I think the Wood Elves would potentially be looking at, but I'm going to be working under the idea prediction slash assumption that it's going to be Slanesh, the High Elves, and the Dark Elves facing off uh, against one another. So with that in mind, let's head into uh, full-on predictions. So we know that this is going to be structured exactly like the, uh, the, the other DLCs, where there's going to be three legendary lords, one legendary hero, and a free LC legendary hero, uh, presumably going along with. When it comes to our options, uh, so looking at uh, the free LC character, once again, this really could be anyone. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be related to the DLC, though I think there is a very good chance it will be related to the DLC because the last two were, uh, with them confirming that the first free LC legendary hero is a Zinch frontliner. The second free LC legendary hero is, uh, has a toolbox, which likely, which to me says dwarf. And so the third one, we don't have a hint about them yet, but I assume that they're related. So let's actually, you know what? Let's swing back around to them at the end. Let's start with Slanesh. 
So dealing with the the Dark Prince, the god of pleasure and pain, uh, the god of hedonism and music and civilization and love and passion and all these other things, uh, Slanesh has um, a couple of interesting directions that can be taken. So continuing to work under our assumption of one legendary lord, a potential lord and or hero, and then three units. So for the legendary lord, there are two big options in my opinion. The first is the mask. So the mask is the ultimate uh, herald character. Uh, we've kind of talked about how there is one big kind of like lesser demon character for each of the gods. Um, and for Slanesh is the mask and the mask is a very interesting character. Uh, she's a uh, pretty, I, I love her design, especially when she got a updated design in age of Sigmar with a new model. But, uh, the mask was formerly one of the most beloved demons of Slanesh by the God himself. Um, Slanesh, uh, has created many different demons who evoke many different aspects. And the mask was the ultimate performer. And her role was that she lived in uh, the court of Slanesh within his palace, and her job was to entertain the god. So whenever something would be going on, she would put on a dance, uh, primarily through dancing, but she would put on some sort of performance that would entertain him according to whatever the mood was going on. So, you know, if there was some kind of large pleasure orgy going on, she would perform some sort of... Uh, um, you know, very seductive or a uh, heightening dance that would really take that experience to the next level. Or if uh, some kind, if, if Slanesh was embracing the sweetness of sorrow, she would perform, uh, a t she would put on a performance that would really evoke those somber and more melancholic feelings and allow, uh, the God to really reach the depths of that, uh, that depression and that, uh, expression. And, she was one of his most beloved. She actually has a lot of uh, similarities to Scarbrand in that sense, uh, especially what ends up happening to her. So one day, uh, Slanesh goes out to fight in a war, and Slanesh uh, does not often do this. Uh, Korn is the only one of the Chaos Gods who is really well known for constantly leaving the Brass Citadel and going out to fight. Uh, he really likes getting involved in the actual wars among demon kind and will often appear to sway the battle one way or the other. Um, and this is what allows him to kind of be such a dominant force is that he's often out there fighting. Whereas his brother gods don't really like to do that. Zinch, uh, tends to really abhor kind of base violence because he finds it boring and banal. Uh, you know, he would much rather be locked away in the, um, uh, his forbidden fortress, uh, or, um, and you know, constant uh, within the, the maze of mirrors and constantly working away at schemes and ploys and backstabs and circles within circles and just doing all sorts of crazy, uh, all bizarre things. And he's far more focused on kind of a macro level of things and never virtually never, uh, leaves his citadel. Uh, Nurgle, on the other hand, is often at his manse, caring for his garden. Uh, Nurgle is very much more of a paternal figure who cares for uh, maintaining the manse and the garden of Nurgle, constantly working on experiments, new brews, new plagues that he lovingly uh, scoops up with his ladle and pours out over the mortal dimensions to see what effects it will have. You know, he's always up to something, uh, but he's busy kind of with his workshopping uh, and his passions. And then you have Slanesh. Uh, Slanesh, of course, is often engaging in sensation, chasing every single thing that can be felt, can be heard, can be touched, can be tasted, etc. Um, and Slanesh is kind of a busy god. Uh, Slanesh sleeps um, so that he can experience dreams and he can experience um, everything that can be experienced. Um, but sometimes Slanesh does indeed go out to fight. Uh, and he's not always successful. Um, and there was one particular war where Slanesh went out and actually took to the battlefield himself and he loses. So Slanesh ends up being, uh, shamed because he is defeated by his brothers. And despite the fact that he took to the field personally as a God, um, he is pushed back and he returns to the, he returns to his palace, um, burning with embarrassment and shame and 
just being in a really, really bad mood. So the mask, seeing that her her master and patron is in such a foul mood, decides to put on a dance to try and raise his spirits. Now, this is where she kind of fucked up because the mask puts on this very elegant and beautiful performance in an attempt to restore Slanesh to a better mood. But Slanesh, being as arrogant and petulant as he is, instead interprets the dance as mockery. That, that she's not trying to make him feel better, but she's making fun of him. And she is pointing out all of his flaws and uh, trying to uh, take advantage of this situation to um, really... That everything she says meant to improve his spirits is instead said in mockery. Or instead poking fun at him in various ways. And Slanesh flies into a rage. And so uh, she gets scar branded, uh, but instead of actually betraying Slash, she didn't. Uh, but Slash doesn't care because Slash is cruel and childish. So Slash uh, banishes the mask from his court, and he exiles her to never again uh, return in front of him. And furthermore, because she loves performing so much, he decides to twist that on itself and turn it into torture. So he curses her so that she is always having to perform. She is never able to rest ever again, no matter how much it hurts, no matter how tired she may become, no matter if she like manifests into the physical world and it were, you know, the, the, all the constraints of physics and realities are pressing down on her and she wants to stop no matter how she feels about it. She must always perform never ceasing, never ending. And so that has been her existence ever since she has wandered the realms of chaos and the mortal realms, uh, forever dancing and putting on performances. However, she continues to be a rather terrifying force in the world. And the mask is probably one of the easiest demons to summon by accident in that if someone is ever, um, experiencing like extreme emotions or, or putting on like a very, very over the top party and they're like really engaging, uh, like they're, they're going to the heights of sensations or they're just being exceptionally greedy or gluttonous or whatever. If they're doing something that potentially ties them to Slanesh, it is not unusual for the mask to make a sudden appearance. Um, there are, there are several stories that basically involve notable parties, especially with the nobles, uh, who in their boredom and what and greed, you know, are often chasing ways to, uh, push away their annoy their boredom and, uh, seeking ever more pleasures, um, which often leads them to doing some pretty shady shit. But there have been stories where like, uh, um, like they're having like a grand banquet and there's an, uh, they're like a grand orgy or there's someone who's just like glutting themselves on all these different, the finest of foods and eating past the point of sense. And suddenly something shifts. So like they're uh, like a guy eating and eating and eating and he ends up kind of being possessed almost by this desire to continuously consume past the point of reason. And he eats so much that he can't stop himself and eventually his stomach bursts. But when he bursts, the mask literally like erupts out of his stomach and take takes over the party where she starts dancing and her dance is infectious and has these terrifying effects on the people around them. Uh, so not only can she command people, uh, to join her in her dances, which never ends well, by the way, uh, but her dance is also a form of combat. It's a form of torture in that she can dance like her form of fighting is said to be terrifying and beautiful to behold because she literally dances through like a regiment of great swords where she's making these like beautiful, uh, choreographed movements And when she passes through like a split second later, everyone that she just passed through, like just collapses with their throat slit or their entrails hanging out or just cut to ribbons. Uh, she's a beautiful and terrifying creature, um, and makes for an uh, absolutely fantastic, uh, legendary Lord material. So that's the mask. Um, the other realistic option I think is steer car. So, uh, steer car is the, more famous lieutenant of Slanesh or er, that served under Archeon, or I guess the most, the more famous lieutenant of Archeon who served Slanesh. Uh, so 
Originally, Archeon had a different Lieutenant of Slanesh back during the Storm of Chaos, uh, but that man ends up being killed by Steerkar and replaced by him because Steerkar thought he could do better. And uh, Steerkar's story very heavily revolves around the idea that he is uh, a man who seeks perfection, a man who seeks to uh, experience many things, and he's always had like a pretty strong connection to Slanesh. What makes him uh, relatively unique among many Slanashites is that he's patient. Uh, when Steerkar kind of initially went crazy and started, not crazy, but when he originally kind of like emerged, he's a Norskin who uh, ended up dominating his tribe and several tribes around him. But there was a shaman or a seer who basically told of a prophecy and told Steerkar that basically uh, a man would one day show up with a, a great flaming sword. And this man... Uh, this is the man that Steerkar would bow down to because he would be the ever chosen, the bringer of the apocalypse and Steerkar waited, which is very unusual for a Slaneshi. Uh, most Slanesh followers are extremely impetuous, uh, and impatient. They usually do not have the ability to restrain themselves because that really in a lot of ways tends to go against, uh, Slanesh is the idea of, uh, waiting for something to come waiting for something to happen. Normally it's about indulging your every desire and um, your every whim the second you feel it, you know, not worrying about um, uh, holding back. But Steerkar waited quite patiently. Like he still did things, you know, he was still probably eating people and uh, engaging in all sorts of nightmarish uh, activities and yada, 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 yada. But um, ultimately what it played into was that uh, he waited until one day he heard about a group of riders crossing his territory and they did not pay tribute. And so Steerkar uh, didn't really care, but there was kind of like, there's like an expectation to being a warlord. So he rode out to hunt these guys down, kill them for uh, kind of insulting him in this way. But when he arrives, uh, if I recall correctly, I believe he kills and duels some of the swords of chaos so, like, they ride out ahead of their leader, who I'm sure you can guess who it is, and uh, they fight Steerkar. He wins, uh, but then Archeon comes forward and draws the Slayer of Kings, which, of course, bursts into flames, and he's like, oh, oh, it's you. Oh, shit. And upon realizing that it's Archeon, Steerkar is like, oh, like, I've, I've been expecting you, uh, and immediately bows down to serve Archeon. Now, what a lot of people love about Steerkar, he has a very cool design. He's got like this crazy, like top knot hair, and uh, he's very, very famous for riding a very particular mount. Uh, it is very affectionately referred to by many of its fans as the Boob Snake, uh, because it is a it is a large demonic steed of Slanesh uh, that, in many of its depictions, has like a large series of rows of uh, boobies. But uh, I suspect its design might be edited somewhat. But I really am personally expecting this creature to make an appearance. Um, I, I think it's going to look somewhat different. Um, you know, it's probably not just going to have full nipples out, so to speak. But I do expect it to appear and uh, play a role in the future. And I'll get into why that is in a minute. So those are your two legendary lord options. Granted, either of them could also be a legendary hero at some point. But personally, I think they would both make for better legendary lords. Uh, if you're looking for a legendary hero for Slanesh, there are a few options, but Sl Slanesh is kind of in a sad position because he's very unexplored in Warhammer Fantasy. Like, Slanesh has kind of always been around, but traditionally, uh, Slanesh kind of got a lot of features in, like, the background but the tabletop wasn't as much touched on. It is quite well documented and well known that there was a good matter, uh, amount of time, especially going into the later editions of Warhammer Fantasy, most notably 8th edition and the end times, where Games Workshop was fully messing around with the idea of just getting rid of Slanesh. Um, you know, Games Workshop is a business. They are a company. And within that company, there are always... Uh, just as time moves on, new faces come in. There is always some marketing person who gets involved or a PR person who learns about Slanesh for the first time and are like, Ooh, like this, we should get rid of this. Like this character is bad for bad for business. 
um, without understanding that Slanesh is kind of core to the identity of Warhammer Fantasy. And there are a lot of really interesting ways to explore Slanesh without it just being like sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You know, um, there's a lot more to Slanesh as the god of excess. It's anything taken to excess. You know, there are six sins of Slanesh, and only one of them is carnality. There are five other sins to explore. Um, you know, there's there's concepts of uh, arrogance and egotism and uh, gluttony and greed. There's all these different things to really get into, you know, and music and art and all the tenets of civilization. That is Slanesh's bread and butter. Um, but especially when you go back to all the older days of Slanesh, you kind of dealt with like a, uh, Warhammer Fantasy kind of went through, uh, so did 40k as well, but uh, Warhammer Fantasy really went through a period of like being very heavily marketed towards teenage boys. Um, and you can see it in a lot of the artwork, uh, especially if you go back to like 6th edition or before. Um, a lot of the art could be a little ridiculous when it came to uh, uh, sex appeal um, to the point of just like just eye rolling. Um, though beautiful art, just, it, you could tell that it was reaching for a certain angle. So, um, because of that, there was a period where Games Workshop was making a lot of really poor decisions. The end times ended up being one of them, but Games Workshop was making a lot of really bad decisions. And one of the things that they were honestly courting the idea of was just completely getting rid of Slanesh. And you can actually see this reflected in the end times where Slanesh just didn't play a role at all. And also age of Sigmar, which literally started off with Slanesh being captured and functionally being removed from the chaos pantheon. You could see these experiments playing out. Now, thankfully they ended up turning that into a much more interesting storyline and Slanesh has since been fully embraced again, but you know, we kind of go through cycles with Slanesh and honestly, a part of me would not be surprised if at some point in the next five to 10 years, there's another weird point where Slanesh kind of gets like, start starts getting pushed into a corner because some idiot gets hired into marketing or PR who doesn't understand Slanesh and also doesn't understand that like Warhammer really is not meant for children. It's meant for mostly adults. Um, uh, especially cause it's core audience has grown up. Um, and you know, children don't spend money. Adults spend money, but in any event, um, so what do we do with Slanesh now in total war? How do, how do we expand the roster? Well, the first thing we do are slong gores. Um, I will say as much as I do actually like the design, I do, I really hope they do not use the Age of Sigmar Slongors because I don't like that implementation of them where the Slongors and Age of Sigmar are more like Minotaur sized. Um, they are big boys with giant crab claws and stuff, which they look cool. They look super cool, but they're too big. Um, I want my Slongors to be more like elite Bestigors, kind of how we talked about with the Pestigors and the Zongors in the prior two days. Uh, you know, I want my Slongors to be extremely fast moving infantry beastmen with very high armor piercing and melee attack. Um, that is what I want. Like maybe one crab claw. And then in the other hand, they have some kind of like fancy scimitar or, um, other like bladed weapon. That's really, uh, good at like cutting through people. Um, I don't want double crab and I don't want them to be huge. And the reason I say that is because it puts them too similar to fiends. Um, the problem age of Sigmar ended up having with their slong gores that someone really should have noticed, but didn't was that the slong gores and the fiends of Slanesh perform very, very similar roles. So you're kind of always dealing with the situation of, well, which of them is better, which in age of Sigmar has traditionally been the fiends. The fiends have a better stat line and are better for their points cost. So you just never see slong gores ever, because why would I take those when I could take fiends instead? And I feel like in total war, it would fall into a very similar issue where why would it, you know, I, you don't want competing roles there. So they should be more like very elite infantry beastmen, not monstrous beastmen. Um, but Slongors definitely number one unit. Um, after that, it gets, it, it gets a little trickier. Uh, we do need an elite knight unit. So we talked about that. We've got doom knights. We've got skull crushers. Uh, we talked about having rot beast knights with the, the thrones of chaos. So for me, I really, really would want for Slanesh would want to see, um, uh, would want to see demonic steed of Slanesh cavalry. I don't, you'd have to come up with a fancy name for them. Um, like knights of desire or, uh, pl uh, pleasure seekers or I don't know, something like that. But, uh, 
you know, heavily armored knights that ride on those very large demonic snake like creatures. Um, so that, you know, they're not steeds of Slanesh. They're these, they're these demonic beasts, these demonic beasts of Slanesh or demonic steeds of Slanesh. Uh, I think that would provide for a really, really fun, interesting unit, you know, having a heavily armored knight unit. That's more about speed and poisoned attacks, maybe at the uh, price of they're not quite as heavily armored. And they're also, uh, less focused on defense compared to traditional knights, but really having them with like extreme speed. You know, they're, they're, they should be the fastest, uh, monstrous cavalry unit in the game. In my opinion, I think that would allow them to have a really, really fascinating niche. So that's two units for the third unit. Um, ah, man, it's, it's, it's tough when you, when you kind of arrive on that third one, they could pull out some kind of monster would probably be the best avenue to take as far as any of the monsters that are not currently in the game. I'm trying to think if there's any monster that really jumps out at me as being Slaneshi off the top of my head. And I, let's see, what are we missing? Uh, we're missing chimeras, but that that's not really uh, appropriate. I think we, we talked about the giant spined chaos beast for maybe, um, I think we talked about that for maybe Nurgle or Zinch, which by the way, I forgot in the thrones of chaos video, Regular toad dragons. I totally forgot about unmounted toad dragons as a creature option, which would absolutely be super badass. So something like that would be super cool. Um, for Sl man, yeah, I'm really struggling to think of something for Slanesh. Um, I mean, if if they're really willing to kind of like stretch the idea as far as like um, it's technically part of like the words of chaos or beastman or whatever roster, but it also could be in Slanesh, uh, just cause in some ways it fits the theme. Um, part of me thinks maybe the Praetan where you have like this, you had this creature that was once like a beauteous, wonderful, um, uh, lovely, uh, great stag that's been horribly perverted and twisted and altered until it's became a creature. That's it, it's so full of self-loathing and hatred that all it cares about is like destroying anybody who sees it and like ripping them apart. Um, and all sorts of like terrifying shit like that. But it, once again, kind of a stretch, um, oh man, I am really struggling to come up with a, Slanesh monster at this time. And I'm suddenly wishing that I had gathered to myself, um, maybe a army book. Hold on. I'm going to put like a very brief pause while I grab a book. Hello there. So sorry about that. I had to, I realized I hadn't really thought of a creature yet that fits Slanesh and realized I was struggling. So I decided to go do a little bit of research real quick. So when it comes to a potential third monster, to join the uh, various chaos rosters, but what I think could debatably make sense for Slanesh, I ended up settling on the Basilisk. So uh, Slanesh kind of has a lot of this idea of like insectoid reptilian um, equine, equine, you know, equine themes kind of all like melding together until you get these like weird, horrific creatures. And it's very much about the idea of like, um, these creatures that give off like auras of like extreme, um, malefic energies or have like particularly nasty venoms and poisons. That's, that's very Slanesh centric. And I actually think the Basilisk could fit that quite nicely, which the Basilisk of Warhammer fantasy are large. They are large, uh, I believe six legged reptilians. And, uh, they're pretty terrifying. Uh, they have rather potent forms of venom. Um, uh, what makes them kind of, uh, notably exceptional compared to a lot of the, uh, basilisks of other worlds is that they do not turn you to stone. Um, they are not like the traditional basilisks of, uh, other settings. Oh, sorry. I said they had six legs. I lied. They have eight legs because they're even grosser and more terrifying. We'll have some cool artwork up here for you to see, but, um, they are extremely venomous and they have like a full on what's known as an aura of vitriol, which the aura of vitriol quite literally realizes or, um, uh, talks about that 
the basilisk is so poisonous. It is so um, corruptive to everything around it as like a purely vile, corrupting entity that it causes weapons and armor as people get close to it to start like decaying and rusting away um, and just falling apart because it just, it just breaks down anything that gets too close to it. And uh, this deadly power not only can kill people, um, but also makes their weapons less effective. So like having this creature running around, that's able to like lower maybe the melee attack or weapon strength of nearby enemies uh, while also probably having like a, so I'm kind of thinking maybe imagining it like a mortise engine type effect where when it's in close combat, it is able to drain health from people within a certain distance, but it also lowers their like weapon strength. So not only is it making it harder for you to kill it, but it's dealing damage to you the entire time. But then on top of that, they have uh, the malici the Maleficent Gaze. So the Maleficent Gaze, as I was trying to say a minute ago, uh, and trying not to stumble over my words and break into a cough, the Basilisk is not like the Basilisks of other universes, which traditionally turn people to stone. That is covered by the Cockatrice in Warhammer Fantasy. The Cockatrice turns you to stone. The Basilisk, on the other hand, turns you into sludge, meat sludge, uh, literally. Um, it has a gaze that is full of so much dark malice for just life um, and uh, anything that when it looks at you, like if, if it gets, if it makes eye contact with you, um, it quite literally causes your soul to be like overfilled with its, um, its, uh, uh, well, Maleficence. And it causes, uh, the way that it's quite literally described is that, uh, <laughs> it's gaze blisters skin and metal and flays the target with tainted power, which causes them to just like start falling apart as you are broken down under just the pure hatred this creature has for you. It's not Nurgleite in the sense that like, it's not looking at you with venom in it, like a traditional sense. It's not poisoning you through like despair or like uh, spitting some kind of bile or acid. It's just looking at you with such a intent gaze of just absolute malice that it causes dark magic to flood into your very being and break you down from the inside out, which is a horrible way to die and is terrifying, but also super cool. So <laughs> that is the Basilisk of Warhammer Fantasy. Eight legs, very large, extremely venomous, you know, so they have poison attacks and stuff like that. Um, quite fast, able to move through forests and uh, across battlefields uh, surprisingly quickly. They're monstrous sized, and they also uh, are able to cause weapons around them to start breaking down as people are also being poisoned by their very presence, uh, not through like stench or disease, but just through how evil these motherfuckers are. And uh, then they have a gaze that turns you into a meat slurry. So yeah, that's the Basilisk. Um, of all the creatures I could kind of really delve into, um, that is the one that I honestly think kind of suits the most. I would very, very much also like to see it appear in the Beastman roster. Uh, Cause I think it, you know, it fits very much as a beastman creature being a forest striding chaos monster, but, uh, initially appearing in the Slanesh roster, I wouldn't have a problem with it all. Um, and of the missing monsters of chaos, it to me kind of comes off as the most Slaneshi though. I would not at all be shocked to see people disagree with that in the comment section, uh, who think it would be better suited to a different God or, uh, just wouldn't make sense with Slanesh. You know, please let me know your thoughts down below. Uh, hopefully my poor editor was able to make everything I just said into a cohesive segment. <laughs> so moving on from Slanesh, uh, no, not moving on from Slanesh, the Lord and hero. Ooh, the Lords and heroes are tricky. Um, you could do some kind of, uh, maybe like Slongor chieftain or Slongor shaman, uh, who has like a mix of the lore of wilds or the lore of shadow, uh, with the lore of Slanesh. Uh, we are missing, the, uh, for a Lord choice, uh, we are of course missing the Slanesh chaos sorcerer Lord 
and we're also missing the exalted hero of Slanesh. So I would gladly take those. I would I have zero issue whatsoever taking those. Um, so if they wanted to just do, actually, that would probably be the easiest thing to do, to be honest, just come out and be like, Hey, here's your, um, same thing with Nurgle, like Nurgle, like here's your basic chaos Lord of Nurgle. And here's your chaos sorcerer of, um, Nurgle hero. Boom. Done for Slanesh. I would do the same thing. Just reversed where it's, here's your chaos sorcerer Lord of, um, Slanesh. And here is your chaos exalted hero of Slanesh. Boom. Done. Easy peasy. Um, so yeah, that's Slanesh. Moving on. So next up, we've got the High Elves. Uh, the High Elves, I actually think, are probably the easiest one in this pack. Uh, for the Lord, I think your most realistic options are either um, Sea Lord Islin, uh, who I would personally go with. Sea Lord Islin is the he's the Grand Admiral of the the High Elven fleets. He is in charge of making sure that Ulthuan stays safe and also maintains its role as kind of like world police when it comes to the various waterways. Um, to be found across the world. He is a notoriously scary high elf. Uh, he's a little more on the cruel side of things as he is a pretty big worshiper of Mathlan, the God of the seas, um, who just like you would expect of an ocean God is not the nicest. Um, you know, there are elements, to, he is technically considered one of the destruction gods. Um, although he's not flat out evil, he's not merciless. Uh, Sea Lord Islin, like one of his most famous moments, uh, as far as like proving that he does not F around is that, uh, there was an incident where Marienburg, the city, um, played host to a pirate who had actually attacked some high elf stuff and stolen a bunch of elven, uh, wares and, uh, riches. So not only did Islin show up to deal with this pirate, but he also wanted to make an example out of Marienburg to show that even uh, aiding a pirate by just allowing them to like sell their goods in your port or even just stay in your port was as bad as being the pirate himself. So um, not only does he show up and like he wreathes the city in an unnatural mist, but he also just full on like unleashes broadsides functionally. Like he just lays waste to the city of Marienburg. He destroys a large portion of the docks. He has his wizards summon like a bunch of fire that starts burning all the warehouses and he kills a lot of people. Um, he doesn't go into the full city proper. Uh, he mostly just torches the warehouse district and the docks and, uh, has his, um, he mops the floor with the Marienburg army and all of their mercenaries, which granted Marienburg is usually considered untouchable because of its Marienburg armies, but Iceland has a super badass fleet and himself is terrifying. So not only do they beat the shit out of Marienburg, but they even forcibly kidnap functionally all of the high elves or the sea elves as they're known from Marienburg and basically force them uh, to come back to Ulthuan, even though they did not want to at all. But he took, he took the elves from Marienburg because he knew that there was a very high chance that if he just left them there, they would basically be killed uh, to make, you know, in, in vengeance, even though they were not directly related to Iceland and they did, they actually hated what Iceland was doing, uh, because they viewed it as unnecessarily cruel. So he gets back all of the elven stuff that was stolen from the pirate, kills all the pirates, burns a good portion of the city, forces all the elves to leave. And the relationship between Marienburg and Ulthuan completely broke down for, mm, I can't remember if it was 10 years or a hundred years. I want to say it was like I want to say it was over a decade. It was a while, but the relationships between them completely broke down for a while. And Iceland caught a ton of shit back at the Phoenix court. Like the Phoenix King was not thrilled with what he did. And a lot of the nobles and stuff who had trade packs with Marienburg were pissed. Uh, but ultimately he was kind of untouchable uh, just because like his position at court completely got annihilated, but he just didn't really care. Um, because all he gives a shit about is waging war on the seas, but he is a major rival for Lokir Felhart. Um, the, the two of them eventually had a really big epic final battle, um, where, uh, Lokir Felhart actually wins. Uh, he manages to use some really crafty, um, spells and sneaky tactics to isolate Iceland's, uh, dragon ship from the rest of the fleet that he was with. And then Lokir Felhart attacks him with his full on black arc. 
And it's this big epic battle, but eventually Lokir Felhart ends up dueling Sea Lord Aislin. And although Aislin hurts Lokir Felhart very, very badly, um, he did not realize how powerful the Kraken Helm was. So if I rec- I can't remember if he slit, he either cuts Felhart's throat open or he like chops into his spine or something, but he does like what should have been a mortal wound to Lokir Felhart, but Felhart just regenerates and then he kills Aislin. Um, and he kills him. He full on kills him where he, he impales him to the chest and then he kicks him into the ocean. Um, and he is presumed killed. However, <coughs> Iceland did not fully die. Uh, as in that moment, Mathlan, the God of the sea, um, retrieved Iceland and returned him to Ulthuan. So he basically washed up on the shoreline and he was always said to be a little different after that. And the reason is that Iceland was resurrected but a notable portion of Mathlan, the God was infused within him. So he was not, he he did not pull a, he didn't pull an end times as far as like, it wasn't that the real Iceland full on died and never came back. It was more that Iceland pretty much died, but was resurrected, but he was not fully himself. He was changed because Mathlan had interwoven himself into Iceland along with his original personality. So he was still the original Iceland, but he had also been empowered with some godly essence. So the Iceland that we have in Total War Warhammer would functionally be the demigod Iceland, uh, though nobody knows that about him yet. They just think that Mathlan favored him as like the ultimate servant and spared him. But since then, he's been kind of just running around kicking ass. So I think he would make for a fantastic legendary lord. He has a ton of really cool stories. Iceland himself is actually relatively unexplored as far as what equipment he carries around. So there is a lot of room to interpret his personal equipment. However, uh, his army is very well fleshed out back during the storm of chaos. So as far as what he would bring, uh, to the, the roster, that would be notably different. Uh, the first big thing would be the storm weavers. So if they really wanted to kind of go all out, they could give us a uh, they could give us a new lord option being or hero option being the storm weavers who were uh, wizards that kind of sort of wielded more priestly magic than necessarily uh, traditional magic. Um, granted, elves priestliness is m- more like a wizard that is also channeling power through their god. They're not traditional priests. They're much more like just regular wizards. Um, they just have very peculiar spells. Um, you could, so you could have storm weavers granted that could just be like a talent. He applies to his wizards, um, to make them have some unique abilities. But, um, so there, there, there are those, uh, the big thing though, I would like to see, uh, if they really wanted to go all out for the Lord, instead of that, I would actually prefer the anointed of Ashurin. I think they could be really, really fun. Um, the anointed, uh, the anointed of Ashurin are the, they are the Lord level, um, uh, Phoenix guard. So they are these super badass guys who ride on phoenixes. Uh, they traditionally ride flame spire phoenixes, but they can also ride um, the ice phoenixes and presumably all the way up into an arcane phoenix. Uh, and they are really super scary Howard wiel- wielding badasses that kick a lot of ass. Um, and I could see them very realistically participating in the fleets as because they ride on phoenixes, they are actually able to answer the call. Uh, of the naval forces and are able to travel vast distances very quickly in order to support uh, various forces. Um, uh, alternatively, they could be put in a different DLC. So uh, maybe uh, it could either be storm weavers or them. I, I would take either uh, just fine. Uh, there's also the, as far as like a new hero goes, there are the sea helms. So the Lothern sea helms were a hero choice in Warhammer fantasy tabletop. Um, they were spear wielding spear and shield wielders that also had bows, uh, and they could ride, uh, so unique mount options, but they were, uh, very supportive. Um, you can kind of think of them almost more like empire captains that happen to have bows and spears. Uh, so they were much more support role characters as opposed to like warrior badasses, you know? So in total war where we have the, uh, the high elf noble, right? being the halberd wielder who's more of like a really strong melee combatant and then you have the handmaiden of the ever queen who has uh the the starfire bow and can deal some pretty nice damage there and then also has uh what a spear is her regular form 
granted there is kind of some overlap there so maybe like the sea helm could be, i could see the argument for making the sea helm a lord there he'd be a little more unique compared to like the prince and princess but eh, uh I, I i i would probably still make him a hero but maybe he has like you really focus on like a shield in one hand and then a hand weapon uh so he's more of like the shielded variant maybe make him a bit tankier than the other two and really focus in on his commander abilities. So giving him abilities that buff the combat stats of nearby troops. Uh, so maybe he's able to like improve reload um, firing skill for like Lothern Sea Guard and stuff. And he also makes them uh, have better like ocean interactiveness. Um, he does have a unique mount being the Lothern Sky Chariot, which that would be the first new unit for the High Elves. So you have the Lothern Sky Chariot, uh, which is a awesome model. I personally love it a lot. It is a flying chariot, so it doesn't have wheels. It's buoyed up by magic, but it's a flying chariot that is pulled around by a swift feather rock, uh, a rock being a, uh, which is a really old fantasy term for lar very large birds. Uh, rocks are smaller than great eagles. Uh, they're not as dangerous as great eagles, uh, but they're still quite large birds. Uh, they're very, very fast and can, you know, really mess somebody up. They're, they're large, they're just not as large as a great eagle. Um, so uh, what's really cool about them is they have a couple of Lothern Sea Guard crew. Um, so these guys are, you know, fighting up there with like spears and bows. Uh, but they also have uh, kind of miniaturized uh, bolt throwers. So kind of kind of like the Scourge Runner chariot for the uh, the Dark Elves. But it is it flies, first of all. And their bolt thrower, if I recall correctly, is less about firing a harpoon, which the, the Scourge Runner Chariot fires like a very powerful single shot that's designed to hurt monsters really badly. The uh, Lothern Sky Cutters are more like miniaturized um, bolt throwers for uh, Eagle Claw bolt throwers. So they're more about shooting like little rapid fire volleys that are great for tearing up heavily armored infantry. So, you know, you still have these armor piercing missiles, but probably no anti-large and more of a focus on firing like, uh, like a pop, 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 pop type of shots, um, or like a little scatter shot instead of just being, you know, flying versions of scourge runners. But, uh, I think that would be a fantastic unit and would really add a lot of really interesting, um, strategies and ideas to the elves and would be a very unique thing for them. Uh, I believe they're the only flying chariot that has a full on artillery piece, though you could argue that Zinch flying chariots with the, like the exalted flamer, like that's, <laughs> it feels like artillery when you're getting hit by it. But, uh, so there's that. The second one is the Murworm. So the Murworms, uh, we've been talking about them for a really long time. I still think it was super fucking weird that they designed a Murworm for the Curse of the Vampire Coast DLC and just didn't make it playable. Like they made Aminar and he's just kind of there, but like I, I, there's no playable version, which is so weird. Like, I feel like it would have been super easy and awesome to have like an undead, uh, Leviathan version where you have like this terrifying undead merworm that's available for the vampire coast and then just give the elves the regular merworm. But here we are. Um, there are different types of merworms. There's paleo worms and uh, I forget what the other one's called at the top of my head. But um, so for the high elves, you could give them multiple variants. Uh, it doesn't just have to be the one. So maybe they could give us like the merworm and then like the really deep sea merworm that has like a cold aura and is like really, really extra terrifying. And like it can like breathe like nightmare breath type garbage. Um, so merworms would be the really fun big monster. You could have one or two variants. And then for the uh and i would also take that opportunity to give an uh, like a free lc undead merworm to the vampire coast just because i think they should have one that's just my opinion um and then uh for the final slot for the high elves uh new units um there there are a couple interesting options there there's a unit that was called sea rangers they were kind of similar to shadow warriors like in in tabletop you functionally played them like shadow warriors um, but I still think that they could, uh, potentially have like a different, um, interaction. Uh, they, they could be a, a different type of unit, you know, maybe less of like, um, true shadow warriors and more of, um, t a type of like just a different kind of elite infantry. Um, I'm not sure what exactly what roles still need to be fulfilled within the high elf roster. Um, granted they might be better as like lower tier infantry, to be honest, uh, sea Rangers, like 
Heil, if anything, Hiles could use more low tier stuff, less high tier stuff, because they already have so much high tier stuff. So that would probably be my my unit options or uh, my unit selections would be the the Lothern Skycutter, um, the Murworm, one or two variants, and then the uh, maybe Lothern Sea Rangers. Uh, I think could be like a really fun expansion. Um, and then for the Lord, either the Anointed of Assurin or the Sea Helm. And then for the hero, you could either do the Sea Helm or the Stormweaver. I think that would make for some really solid stuff. For uh, I do think that uh, one of the legendary heroes, either the free LC legendary hero or the paid legendary hero should be a high elf and it should be Corhill, Captain of the White Lions. I've talked about him quite a bit. Uh, Corhill is a super duper big badass. Uh, he is the only white lion who dual wields axes because he's so, he is so fucking strong that he carries a regular white lion great axe with one hand. And then he's got another axe in his other hand. Cause he's just that much of a beefcake. Uh, he wears a very, uh, awesomely enchanted lion pelt that he got from killing a heavily chaos mutated, um, uh, war lion with his bare hands. That was a lot bigger and scarier than regular war lions and was also completely immune to um, most weapons because it was obviously based on the, it, it's very much taken from the Hercules myth uh, or Heracles uh, myth of the, the lion that he kills where he had to strangle it. Corhill did the exact same thing. Um, but um, so that would be super badass. him as a legendary hero. He should be very, very good at protecting your Lords. Like a lot of type of lot of like guardian uh, focused abilities where he's able to like buff and protect your characters and your army because he is the captain of the white lions. He's the ultimate bodyguard. Uh, but he also rides a white lion chariot. Uh, so having, being able to have a hero with a unique chariot option would be super duper fun. And because we already have that, um, that make a wish, um, not really legendary Lord, but he has a unique design and he can ride a white lion chariot Lord. I don't think core Hill should be a Lord. I think a legendary hero is the perfect slot for him and uh, just make him available to all the high elf factions. So I would either have him be the DLC legendary hero or the regular legendary hero. All right. And that takes us to the final uh, faction, which I believe is the dark elves. All right. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be struggling when, with the dark elves and wood elves functionally. Uh, as far as legendary Lords go, Talaris Dreadbringer. Uh, so Talaris is a pretty interesting character. He is a very terrifying, badass, great sword wielding, uh, menace to the world who is kind of insane because he can literally hear the voice of Cain in his head. And it is not actually like insanity. He genuinely hears the voice of Cain in his head, which makes him a pretty terrifying threat because it often results in him leaving, uh, Harganeth at the head of a, like the blood voyages are kind of based on him, but he, it, it is not uncommon at all for him to vanish because the voice of Cain tells him he needs to go collect some kind of artifact or he needs to kill someone or just like shed blood in a particular place in the world. And so he'll just wander off to go take care of something. And the voice of Cain very reliably leads him around. So he is often running off on crusades uh, to go find something or kill something. And he is a beat stick. Uh, he's very heavily armored. He's traditionally an infantry character. Uh, he doesn't have any mounts um, on his profile, though that wouldn't necessarily stop him from getting one in Total War. Uh, we, if there's one thing Total War likes doing, it's giving mounts to people that didn't traditionally have them. But uh, having, I think, a big badass melee lord who wields a big, just two-handed fuck you executioner blade um, would be refreshingly different for the Dark Elves. You know, we've got we've got wizards, we've got. Uh, naked ladies. We got naked grandma out there. Uh, we've got, you know, uh, sorcerers and we got very, very tanky malice dark blade. Um, so I think just having like an expert murder boy who carries a big fuck you armor piercing sword and is really good at just cleaving through things and dealing massive amounts of damage would be, uh, as different as it can get. Um, I even like, honestly, I even don't think shadow blade would be as interesting to me as to large dreadbringer. I also think there's a lot of fun things to explore with his whole concept of he hears the voice of Kane telling him to go do things. So you have a much easier time kind of explaining why he's appeared somewhere else in the world. And, um, I think that would do well to make him an opponent for, uh, potentially the mask or steer car and sea Lord Island. 
um, is that, you know, him kind of showing up places would put him in a good position to be attacking those forces. And as a canine, he fucking hates Slanesh. You know, the only other, the only other characters left for the dark elves are uh, shadow blade and Corin Darkhand, who is the, the bodyguard for Malekith. But I think both of those would do better as legendary heroes. So Talar's Dreadbringer is your legendary Lord. Uh, for if either of the hero options ends up being a dark elf, like I just said, uh, I would either do shadow blade, the assassin who has been teased to us since Warhammer two, uh, because he actually is the assassin that appears in the vortex campaign. And yet he's not playable, which is bullshit. Uh, he is the deadliest assassin ever in uh, dark elf history. Um, he was trained by Hellebron and he is a nasty piece of work. But Shadow Blade, I think, would make for the best option. Just a absolutely fantastic uber assassin, especially because our assassins keep being made into legendary lords, which is not a bad thing. But like, I don't know. I really feel like an uber assassin does better as like an agent that can join your army, but is more about doing agenty things. Uh, which they they kind of solved that with Deathmaster Snitch by giving him his unique little system. But like for Shadow Blade, I I would very much prefer him as a legendary hero. Uh, and then from there, uh, you could do Corin Darkhand. Um, once again, I think he would be very similar to Corhill, just an uber, uh, super badass bodyguard that wields a big fuck you halberd, um, and is all about enforcing like Malekith's will and giving a lot of bonuses to like the loyalty system for your various generals, because he does not fuck around with, um, uh, traitors. He has zero issue killing people, uh, who end up being like a problem. So I think there would be, uh, I think he could have some really fun skills and talents to really interact with the really helping you get the most out of your various generals, uh, while also protecting them and being a big badass. Uh, as far as units, that's where things start to go downhill really fast. I really don't know what le there's left to do for the dark elf roster as far as like generic stuff, like Named characters, sure, I can think of stuff, but like lords and heroes, kind of kind of run out of steam there. To be honest, like we've already got beast lord or beast masters, we've got dread lords and dread ladies, we've got the supreme sorceresses. Um, like we technically have black arc fleet masters, they're just not playable as dark. Uh, they're just not called that, but like they're in the they're in the roster. Um, the, the fleet masters, like I would, I still wish they would change the black arc admirals to be called black arc fleet masters. Cause that's what they're actually calling tabletop. But like, eh, um, we're not missing anything. <laughs> we have the entire roster. So yeah, I don't know. Um, they could do what they've been doing sometimes when they're scraping the bottom of the barrel where they could come out and be like, Oh, we're going to give them, um, we're going to like take some of the unit champions for the various units and upgrade them into being new units. They've done that a lot. That's, that's kind of a favorite hat trick of theirs where it's like, Oh, like they did that with cold one nights, right? Dread cold one dread nights are literally just the unit champion. So, you know, it's like, Oh, instead of executioners, you get dry arc masters instead of shades, you get blood shades instead of <laughs> Doomfire warlocks, you get master warlocks. Instead of Sisters of Slaughter, you get Handmaidens of the Shards. You know, they they could keep pulling that. Um, I feel like at some point it kind of runs itself out. But um, as far as, um, but any of those could work. Um, none of them jump to my mind as, oh, they need this. Um, I, I got nothing. I'm going to be totally honest. Um, the, literally the only thing I could think of would be like <laughs> the... Uh, the, the, the anointed, which were part of Marathi's Slaneshi host, which would very explicitly kind of conflict with this, my idea of it being like, oh, the dark elves would want to be fighting Slanesh, right? Um, which the anointed are dark elves who willingly allowed themselves to be possessed by Slanesh demons. So like they're possessed, but they still kind of have control over their bodies and they're like freakishly strong. So yeah, I got nothing. I'm going to be totally honest. Uh, even when looking at the monstrous roster, there's really nothing I would associate with dark elves, um, as far as monsters go. Um, like I guess they could have an, one of the, th the three types of merworms or, 
Um, they could have the, like, maybe they could just kind of come up with, Oh, you know what? They could get sea dragons. That would actually be slick sea dragon. Yeah. Give me sea dragons. Uh, so the, the sea dragons are, or sea drakes are very, 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 uh, there's another name for them. Um, but they're very heavily associated, uh, with the dark elves. They often are responsible for pulling the black arcs, um, or being around them. If you ever read go Trek and Felix elf slayer, there's like a whole, there's a number of scenes where, uh, you get to see these, uh, sea dragon creatures. Um, if I recall correctly, they're noted for saying hook is like, they make like a hook sound when they're like calling. Um, but I, I think a sea dragon would be very, very cool. So just like a really big worm. So like a, you know, like a big snake like dragon that doesn't have wings, uh, that's able to like slither across the battlefield and like slam into people, breeze fire. Um, Uh, I think that could actually be super cool. So yeah, give me a sea dragon. I'll take that. Um, But after that, I run out of things. Uh, So maybe a sea dragon for the monster. And then uh, you can give me just, I don't know, pick your favorite unit champion. Maybe like the master of masters of towers or as like an elite um, black guard unit or the, you know, the, the big bad executioner upgraded to a super form. I don't know. Pick any of those. It works fine. Uh, blood shades. Sure. Why not? But, uh, I think that would work just fine as far as, uh, you know what they could do though for Lords and heroes, give us the rest of the lords of magic CA, please. Uh, so like give us all the missing sorceresses and Supreme sorceresses. I think that would go great. Uh, I give me my heavens caster, life caster, light caster, you know, give me all the missing lores of magic. There's no reason the dark elves shouldn't have all the battle lores. Um, so yeah, uh, wood elves, very similar idea. Give me the rest of the battle lores, you cowards. Uh, so give me all of my missing spell singers and spell weavers. Um, I also would really love to see a uh, shadow dancer. Um, shadow dancer is a, it could be a Lord or a hero as far as I'm concerned, but the shadow dancer is a shadow cast wielding, uh, Uber war dancer. So it's the war dancer character and they have like really crazy, like combat abilities and stuff. Uh, I think they would make for a fantastic Lord or hero, uh, being like a really strong combat, uh, caster hybrid. As far as like the legendary Lord, it have to be Araloth. It would have to be Araloth. Uh, Araloth is really the only, uh, core missing concept, uh, is like, we need a regular wood elf. We need a regular guy who is just such a badass that he's able to go to, like Araloth. There's nothing special about Araloth. He, there is nothing. He doesn't have a demigod in him. He's not like a forest spirit. He's not some kind of like creation of the forest. He's just a guy who is so badass that he was actually able to go toe to toe with Tyrion when Tyrion was wielding the sword of Cain. Now, granted, he was like just trying not to die, but he successfully avoided dying, which says a lot. Like he is a very skilled duelist. Uh, he wields a spear and shield. Uh, he also has a, a hawk with him. Um, uh, uh, Scarn the eye thief, uh, who's exactly what he sounds like. He's this little hawk. That's adorable, but he's also kind of terrifying because he literally flies at people and rips out their eyeballs, uh, <laughs> because he's kind of terrifying. Uh, so I think that would be a really fun active ability where he's able to like pick an enemy hero or Lord and they take a bit of damage and their melee attack and melee defense just like drops for like, you know, 10 to 30 seconds. So he can really just be like stab, 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 stab with his spear. Uh, he's also unbreakable, which is a really interesting, uh, dynamic. So, uh, yeah, Erloth would be super duper cool. Uh, they could also, if they wanted to make me the happiest girl of the ball, uh, they, they could come out with, um, uh, Nyeth the prophetess. Ah, I got it. I didn't have to look at a book. Um, uh, Nyeth would be uh, super cool. Uh, she is the most powerful wizard within Athaloran who is not Ariel. Uh, Nyeth the prophetess does show up in Warhammer two as the advisor character for the sisters of twilight, but like, eh, who cares? Um, I would love to see her implemented in game. She is said to be an extremely powerful uh, sorceress. Um, you know, I would love to see her have like a mix of the lore of heavens and the lore of life. That'd be kind of a cool idea. Uh, maybe a little bit of high magic in there, but, uh, once again, she is also a regular elf. Um, she is not a demigod. So, uh, one, either one of them, I think would be a fantastic offer. Uh, as far as legendary heroes go, 
Um, I don't, the Wood Elves aren't missing anyone. Uh, could be Scarlock. Scarlock the Hunter could be really cool. Um, Scarlock is a very, very famous character from the literature because uh, he is a he is an incredible sniper. He is one of he is literally the only guy, the only regular guy who ever killed Morger um, by shooting him through the head with an arrow um, or shot him through the eye. Which is, if you know Morger, you should know how fucking impossible that is to do. Uh, Morger is very explicitly nigh unkillable via ranged weapons and Scarlock managed to, uh, kill him. Granted, Morger was severely weakened. It was already like pin cushioned with a bunch of other arrows and he was near death, but it's still an incredible feat. Um, but Scarlock the Hunter was super duper famous for wandering the world for a long time, uh, because he basically left Athel Lauren to go explore all the human kingdoms so he could like gather news and figure out what the hell was going on outside of the forest. And uh, he kind of like had a band of merry men that were other elves. And uh, there's actually kind of a lot of lore being explored with him more recently with the uh, Lara Lorne forest updates we're getting in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Um, so Scarlock could be a lot uh, super duper fun. Um, very famous character, uh, participated in a lot of stuff. I think he'd make a great legendary hero. Is like a super god tier archer. Um, and I also could see him being available to multiple factions. Like I could also see him being a wood elf that is available to like the wood elves, Bretonia and the empire, which uh, could be a lot of fun. So yeah, that's everything. Uh, this video is already potentially a lot longer than the others. So I need to wrap it up. Uh, let me know what y'all think of all my ideas down below. Um, oh, I forgot to predict units. Shit. <laughs> so I don't know. The wood elves are even harder than the dark elves. Um, cause they don't at least have naval stuff that I can pull on. I, I really feel like I'm tapped out for the wood elves. Um, they are, in my opinion, they are strictly, and we need two characters, maybe three characters and like the shadow dancer. And that that's it. That's all I got. Um, so I'm just going to really hope it's Slanesh, Hiles and dark elves, I guess, and not wood elves. Uh, cause I got, I got nothing. I got nothing. We, we we've got fucking zotes and, um, and, uh, great stag knights. Like there's, there's, there's nowhere else we can go, <laughs> um, <laughs> or else we're going to have to start pulling out like Sylvaneth units, uh, which I don't think games workshop is going to let, uh, allow. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's all I got. Uh, thank you all for watching. Let me know what y'all think of every, all this down below. Uh, do you think it's going to be elves? Do you think I'm completely off base and it's going to be like two other races, uh, if it is the elves, do you like what I picked for them? Or are you like, oh, so tech, you're so stupid. How can you not think of this unit or this unit? Um, or like, why would you pick those characters? Like, why would you pick Sea Lord Isley instead of Kara Dryan? Maybe, um, do let me know. So, uh, thank you all for watching and I'll see you tomorrow for the, uh, the last of the quartet we'll be discussing. And then we're going to, you know, talk about some other things. So thank you again for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.